So for the next 18 minutes, we're going to leave New Hampshire, and we're going to go over to the rainforests of Africa. And I'm going to have the honor to share with you my life's work and my passion. This is my passion, something that's very easy to be passionate about. And for the past 21 years, I've had the honor and the privilege to work with these animals in the wild and to become an advocate for their existence, continued existence, and their well-being. But my story and their story starts with this woman. This is Diane Fossey, the famed Diane Fossey, who's the subject of the movie Gorillas in the Mist. She's one of Louis Leakey's three women. Louis Leakey was a very famous anthropologist. He sent Baruch Galdikas out to the fields in Borneo to study orangutans. He sent Jane Goodall to Tanzania to study chimpanzees. And he sent Diane to Rwanda to study gorillas. And in 1967, she created the Karasoki Research Center. Her story is my story as well, because when I was a junior in college, she came to my school, and she gave a presentation. And in a very small auditorium, she started her tale about Digit. Digit was one of the first gorillas that came up to her and, and had an interaction with her. When she first got there, she had been touched before, but there was this one little gorilla, actually, she met when he was just two years old, a little black fur uh, ball. And she immediately took to him, because I think, ultimately, he was kind of an outcast. She was kind of an outcast, and they had a special bond together. So one day he came up to her, and he gently laid his hand in her hand. And then he took her notebook, probably wondering why or what she's writing about, because she always had her notebook with her, and he studied it intently. And then he curled up, and he fell asleep beside her. And that was you know, her relationship with Digit. She often, in her, in her uh, talk, she talked about him like he was human. And you could tell that these gorillas were her family. But this was only half her story. The other half was about stuff like this. This, is, this was Diane's war. The gorillas were disappearing faster than she could record them. When in 1960, there were about 400 to 500 gorillas, 400 to 500 gorillas. And by the time 1979 came around, there were about 240. They were being killed. Their hands were being made into ashtrays. Their heads were being sold as trophies. And if there was a baby left behind after the, after the adults were killed, they were sold on the black market. So Diane had a, a, war, a war to fight. And she told us about this tale. And she told us about how uh, she struggled every day to save the gorillas. And she lived with them on a daily basis. And at some point, <laughs> she started getting a little mellow. And we knew something was coming up. And this is Diane with Digit, with his, his head and his hands cut off. And this was the picture she took um, and plastered around town to show how the Rwandan government didn't care. They, were turning, they just turned their backs. It was illegal to kill these animals. But so she had to fight her own battle. And it was a very difficult battle to fight. Diane was learning very quickly a very simple principle in ecology. And that is when two species share the, share the same habitat and share the same resources, the one with this, the advantage, even if it's a slight advantage, always wins. So non-human animals and human animals, when they compete, humans always win. What could she do? She got together, and this was the innovation. You know, when before in conservation, governments would come in and they'd build an imaginary fence around an area. They would move everybody out of the area, anyone who would, who had lived there their whole lives, their whole heritage, and they'd put them outside the park. They would forbid them from going inside the park, and it was not really a good way of doing conservation. Ecotourism was a co was a collaborative, innovative approach to conservation that allowed for um, the poachers to be hired as rangers and guides, for the local people to be able to get money and revenue that came in from tourism. And it was basically a win-win situation. Unfortunately, that was the end of Diane's story. She, um, a year after she came to my school, she was actually murdered. Her head was cut off with a machete. 
They never caught who did it, but given the form of execution, it became kind of clear to a lot of people that the poachers who she had once tortured um, had perhaps tortured her. So my story begins in, uh, well, it began in Central Africa, where I went to study Western lowland gorillas. And I was really interested in understanding how an animal's environment influences their behavior. And my main idea was to go over to the mountain gorillas as part of my dissertation and do a comparative, like, natural study. We have the lowland gorillas living in this lush vegetation, and we have mountain gorillas living up here, very different. Wonderful opportunity for a natural experiment. But soon after I got back from Central Africa, I came down with a severe case of cerebral malaria. And after 10 days in intensive care, I had to promise everybody, especially my parents, that I would never go back again. But uh, about a year later, I was packing my bags, and I was on my way <laughs> to Uganda. And um, I wanted to just point out these two green spots on the map. The, the green spot on the bottom is the Virunga volcanoes, where Diane was doing her work. And the green spot on the top is Bwindi Impenetrable National Park. This is another population of mountain gorillas that we really didn't know anything about. And this is where I went to do my study, especially because of the genocide and the warfare that was going on in Rwanda. That area was generally closed. But from my field site, which is in the, um, you know, where the map is, you can kind of see the Virungas in the background. It's about 15 miles away, but totally isolated. My camp was simple. Um, you know, we went basically where the gorillas went. I just want to point out some of the people that I worked with, especially Everest, who's there in the white t-shirt. He started working for me when he was 14 years old. He's now almost 30 and has four kids and is starting his own safari business. So we've been, I've had a long, a long history down there. And um, this is our group. This is uh, Magozi. This was actually a picture taken by one of my students, Nate Bosch, who's a uh, a, a student of mine at Southern New Hampshire University who had an opportunity to go with me to the field in 2010. And while I was studying the gorillas, you know, I went there to do this comparative study initially. And while I was trying to follow the gorillas to look at their natural behavior, I found myself at the end of the day sitting in some farmer's field because that's where the gorillas were hanging out. They were never in the forest. So in 1999, I totally threw out that idea for research, and I started to focus on the impacts of tourism. And one of the prerequisites for tourism is habituation. So in habituation, you slowly acclimate your presence to the gorillas. So maybe at one point, you're very far away, and then over a course of time, you get closer and closer and closer until you become what some say a neutral element in their environment. Basically, these wild animals whose only predator are humans, be, lose their fear of humans. So this is what I started to study. And I found very quickly, this is just some early research from 2001 to 2002, where we'd go around with global positioning systems, and we would kind of track where the gorillas were going. And you can see the green part in the Buindi Impenetrable National Park. That's where they're supposed to be living. And then the white part on the outside is farmer's fields. And they were spending 65 to 70 percent of their time outside on, farm, on farmers' fields. And if you look at the photograph, that's the edge of the park. You know, you take one step in or one step out, and you're right on agricultural fields. And this has become a major problem for tourism in the area, because this is what happens. So this is one of the silverbacks sitting in one of the cornfields. And they don't necessarily eat corn, but you know, they do eat a lot of the other things that people plant in the area. And this is a eucalyptus tree. This is a eucalyptus tree that's been stripped by um, the gorillas. Their eucalyptus, of course, is not native to Africa, but it's planted because it's fast growing. And it's a great resource for them to have for firewood and for building. But the gorillas, in one year, destroyed more than 90 eucalyptus trees. And unlike Megilla gorilla, if you're old enough to know that reference, <laughs> um, you, they don't eat bananas. They don't go around and pick the bananas from the tree and you know, peel them down and eat them. They actually rip open the bark or trunk of the banana tree. So they're not just you know, going around and grazing. They are destructive foragers. 
and the livelihood of the people in this local area all around uh, Buindi Impenetrable National Park is devastated on a daily basis. And you can always tell when the gorillas had broken into some farmer's field because the pith, the really juicy pith inside, gives them a pretty bad case of diarrhea. So what else happens when they come outside? outside the park. Well, they're exposed to all of the things that they wouldn't be exposed to if they lived in their natural habitat. And that is all the people that live around the park. So they're exposed to parasites. They're exposed to infectious diseases. They have giardia. They have the same parasites that the cattle living along the edge of the park have. They have the same parasites the local people living in the area have. We lost a, a young infant gorilla to scabies, which is just a skin lice. And my group gets uh, scabies generally once or twice a year, and the veterinarians have to come in. These are the, the gorilla doctors who do an amazing job keeping these gorillas alive. But should we really need gorilla doctors to be keeping the gorillas alive? And some of you might have seen this on YouTube. Last December, it became viral, and they actually had it on Good Morning America. You know, given my talk so far, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, you know, in tourism, tourism's supposed to be very regulated. When you go out on a gorilla tour, um, only eight people are allowed to go at once. You need to stay at least seven meters from the group. You can't be sick and go out on the, on the tour. You certainly can never touch a gorilla. And if you need to sneeze or anything like that, you need to turn away. Well, in this case, um, John King, who's the photographer here, uh, was actually not visiting the gorillas. The gorillas were visiting him. And this is a, a case where the gorillas have become extremely overhabituated. Over generations and generations of no fear of humans, there's nothing to keep them from approaching. This is an intense situation um, because the young individuals are the ones that are the most curious and tend to be the ones that want to have contact. But they're also the ones that are least developed. Um, their immune systems are pretty weak, and they're very vulnerable to disease. We've had gorillas die of measles. We had six gorillas die of human-introduced measles, because gorillas don't, don't get measles. And then we had the, the veterinarians come in and actually vaccinate the 65 wild gorillas against measles. Just in 2009, we had two adults die of a human-introduced in, induced virus. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of hazards here. But when Good Morning America goes on and has this as their play of the day, they're giving the wrong message to everybody. You know? um, you're not going to go see gorillas and expect to, to touch them or be touched by them. And finally, um, I know I have some gruesome pictures in, in my presentation, but this is reality. You know, normally, I'm the one in the audience kind of turning away. But, um, but in 2007, and this is kind of a, a discouraging story because it was actually people who were responsible for governing the area who were responsible for killing these animals. In Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda and, and Uganda, where these animals exist, it's politically unstable. And the militia are all over the place, different fractions of different militia. And these gorillas were actually killed execution style. These, uh, this was a very popular tourism group. Um, all the members in the group were killed. And so when gorillas lose their fear of humans, there's no reason for them to be scared of poachers. And in another situation in Rwanda, when in Democratic Republic of Congo, when warfare was really bad, someone did a study and they found that gorillas who were habituated were 1.6 times more likely to be killed than gorillas who weren't habituated. So the very thing that was supposed to be saving them was putting them in harm's way. Again, after all of this information, <laughs> Today, Bwindi, especially the government there, is continuing to habituate more and more gorillas. In 1993, when tourism started, there were only two groups and about 15 individuals that were habituated, that were visited every day by tourists. And then by 2002, there were three groups, and 2006, four groups, and in 2011, just recently, nine groups composing more than 140 gorillas, which is more than 45% of all of the wild gorillas that live in that national park. In the Virungas, where Diane Fossey worked, 75% of all the gorillas there are habituated for either research or tourism. It's kind of like Disney. What, it, what is a wild gorilla? And the money, the money that comes in, 
Uh, right now, I think it's $500 a person. Eight people pay $500 each to go see a group. Multiply that by nine groups. That's about $34,000 a day of money that's coming in. And that's not being shared with the local community, at least equally. Here's a lodge right outside my field site. Um, it's a $900 a night to stay at this lodge. It was actually voted best cocktails in all of Uganda. <laughs> but this is the reality of in Karingo area where the gorillas live and where the tourists come. There's no running water, there's no sanitation, there's no electricity, and there's very, very little compensation. This was supposed to be a win-win situation for saving the gorillas and for helping local people in development. So what do we need? We need to instill an environmental ethic. We need a major shift in our ethos, away from an anthropocentric approach to saving animals because they do something for us, and more towards a situation where they are recognized for their own worth and their own value. The Bwindi gorillas are not employees of the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. They're not a commodity. They don't need to sacrifice themselves for their own survival. So I really don't think that this is what Diane Fossey had in mind when tourism first started. And I really don't think that she would be really happy with us right now and the way that we've gone about trying to save the mountain gorilla. Thank you. <laughs>